Next, on PJ Radio's The Unconventionals. So I started to design glasses according to the needs and wants of the communities where we were working. Uh, lo and behold, um, in the same factories where I was manufacturing glasses for people living on less than $4 a day, uh, I would see on the production line next door uh, Marc Jacobs glasses coming off the line and all these sort of major fashion labels. Um, and you discover that there's a disconnect between what it costs to manufacture glasses and what they're being sold for. So I had an eye exam about six months ago. My prescription changed a bit, and I needed new glasses. I go to an optometrist here in Harvard Square, and the doctor says, well, it's good timing. Our frames are 20% off this month. So I found a couple pair that I liked, and the discounted price was 600 bucks. I don't wear glasses all the time. It just seems like a ridiculous amount to pay. Now, this is how I met Warby Parker, our guest today. Warby Parker is an online retailer. They sell eyeglasses but they sell beautiful glasses. They have their own designers. And these are glasses made from exactly the same materials as the $600 Hugo Boss glasses I was looking at. In fact, they're built in exactly the same Chinese factories. I paid $125 for my Warby Parker Walden frames. That's for everything, lenses, coatings, all the stuff that typically costs you extra. This felt like a great find for me, and it's one that I love to tell people about. But it's also an awesome model to build a business on. I mean, who isn't interested in paying 75% less for the same thing? This is Warby Parker's value proposition, and they've been enormously successful since their startup a few years back. But along the way, there were some pretty big obstacles. They had to figure out product design that would pass muster in the fashion world. And they had to convince people to buy glasses online. And this is a product that we want to see on our faces before buying. Warby Parker overcame these obstacles, and it would be a great story if it stopped there, selling great glasses for a fraction of the cost by cutting out the middleman. What makes the company truly interesting and a natural fit for the unconventionals is that they do a whole lot more than this. They were founded with an explicit social mission. For every pair purchased, they give a pair of glasses to someone in the developing world. And in a culture where companies are started with the intention of selling out to the highest bidder, Warby Parker set out to create a brand and a culture and a company that will last. We visited Warby Parker's headquarters in New York City's Soho neighborhood and talked with Neil Blumenthal, founder and co-CEO. To understand the company, you have to start a few years ago in The Hague. Yeah, I, I think the journey is probably not typical, but I guess uh, every uh, every entrepreneur's journey sort of hits different places, but um, I had originally gone to school to Tufts to study international relations and and history. I was really passionate about foreign policy in particular, thought that I might end up working for the State Department, was really passionate about um, uh, wars and uh, thinking that if we could actually help prevent them or end them, that we could focus on the big issues like health and education. So immediately following uh, my undergraduate, I traveled to The Hague and studied international mediation and negotiation and conflict resolution. I returned back to New York to work at the International Crisis Group, which is a think tank that comes up with policies to resolve deadly conflict. Um, really it found it intellectually stimulating, but was finding that I, I wasn't able to have as much of a direct impact as I wanted. You know, w- when you're doing policy work, ultimately uh, you can come up with great ideas, but it's really about sort of the, the people in positions of power, the politicians, or in this case also warlords that have the power to implement change. So it was at that point where I was sort of looking to see, well, what should I do next? And I met this really dynamic eye doctor, Jordan Castillo, uh, who had this great idea to train low-income women to start their own business selling glasses in their communities throughout the developing world. Um, and I didn't know, but uh, close to a billion people on the planet don't have access to eyeglasses. And to me, that was just insane, right? And it's a, it's a, it's an instinct that, or a need that I think is recognized to some degree, right? Because aren't there nonprofits that send... First world used eyeglasses to third world countries and 
There definitely are, but not at the scale to really solve this problem, right? Um, to get a billion pairs of donated glasses, right, is just, it, it's not feasible. Not to mention that people are losing and breaking their glasses, their prescriptions are changing, and then each year m more new people need glasses. So you needed uh, a sustainable solution. And I thought that this idea to actually create jobs about giving eye exams and selling affordable glasses just made a ton of sense. Uh, so I moved down to El Salvador to work on sort of the pilot program, ended up becoming a director of this nonprofit Vision Spring and spent five years expanding the program to about uh, you know, 10 different countries. And one of the things that you find is that when you treat people as value conscious consumers, you treat them as, uh, with dignity, give them the, the choice to buy, you know, you learn a lot versus just giving away used glasses. Because so, it turns out maybe people don't really like wearing used glasses, right? Exactly. Like yeah. Just because people don't have a lot of money doesn't mean <laughs> they don't care about how they look. Yep. Uh, and I'd literally meet people, it could be in northern Bangladesh, who'd rather be blind than wear a donated pair of 1970s cat eyes. Because <laughs> they get laughed at yeah. by their friends and neighbors. Yeah. So I started to design glasses according to the needs and wants of the communities where we were working. So in parts of India and Bangladesh, it was like gold wire and gunmetal frames. Uh, would go over to China to manufacture them. Uh, lo and behold, um, in the same factories where I was manufacturing glasses for people living on less than $4 a day, uh, I would see on the production line next door uh, Marc Jacobs glasses coming off the line and all these sort of major fashion labels. Um, and it was there that there were you soon dis discover that there's a disconnect between what it costs to manufacture glasses and what they're being sold for. Neil's insight at Vision Spring that it made more sense to him to treat people as consumers instead of charity cases led him back to the States to pursue an MBA at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business. As Neil went on to tell us, a friend of his at Wharton, his now co-founder Dave Gilboa, had just left a pair of $700 eyeglasses in the seat back pocket on a recent flight. That had sparked a discussion about how the high retail cost compared to the extremely low manufacturing cost that Neil knew about from his Vision Spring days. This is where Warby Parker was born. We knew that glasses would eventually be sold online. Uh, and the advantage to us by selling online and building a business uh, through e-commerce was that we could have direct relationships with our customers. So we could design our own glasses, uh, work directly with the factories with whom I had relationships with, um, and then sell them to customers uh, and basically give customers all of that retail markup. And because we were going to do it under our own brand, right? We don't, there's no licensing fee. Curse me, there's different ways to go. You could, you could just really try to make this about cheap eyeglasses online. But you didn't go that way. Yeah, I, you know, I think this business, Warby Parker, really came from our own personal experiences. Um, walking to an optical shop, getting excited about a pair of glasses, and walking out feeling like we overpaid. But part of the story is that we paid too much, but we also wanted beautiful glasses. Um, and we also think that glasses stand for something and, you know, brand is important. So it wasn't just about getting a bunch of cheap glasses and selling it online. Right? It was about how are we going to transform this industry that has been ripping people off for decades. When Neil refers to this industry, he's really taking a shot at a single company, Luxottica, who along with owning some of the biggest brands in eyewear, like Ray-Ban and Oakley and Chanel, also owns three of the largest retail companies, LensCrafter is one, and the second largest vision insurance company. They're a virtual eyewear cartel. We'll really get into Luxottica later in the program, but it was obvious right from the start that Neil and his partner saw a big, fat, and satisfied monopolist and recognized an opportunity. Rita Gunther McGrath, who's a professor at Columbia Business School, has written a book called The End of Competitive Advantage, and she talks about exactly these kinds of opportunities. Her advice, the would-be disruptor first needs to select a target, and there's no better target than a lazy incumbent. Better yet, an entire niche or setting in which multiple incumbents have enjoyed a privileged position for a long time. Sounds an awful lot like Luxottica in the eyewear industry. That got us excited about the industry, because you look at these dynamics, um, it's massive industry, $65 billion a year globally, $22 billion alone in the U.S., 
and uh, dominated by one particular company, Luxottica. Luxottica. Yeah. They do about $7 billion a year in revenue. They're vertically integrated. So from a business student perspective, it's a beautiful business. Right, right, right. <laughs> from a consumer perspective, um, it may be, you know, inflating prices. If you look at the price of Ray-Bans in the 70s, they were like $30. Today, they're like 150 plus. Right. Um, so uh, we thought that there was an opportunity here where we could come in, uh, build our own brand, design glasses that people want, and, and sell them through WarbyParker.com for $95, including prescription lenses, instead of you know $500. So there it is, 95 bucks for extremely fashionable frames and prescription lenses, all available with the click of a mouse. We've seen this shift before. Zappos did it with shoes, Blue Nile did it with diamonds and engagement rings. But as you can imagine, with an industry that had yet to see this kind of transformation, there were some big questions and obstacles. Neil wondered if people would buy glasses online. It's such a personal purchase, one that's pivotal to expressing your style. They knew people wouldn't buy without the ability to try pairs on. So their first solution was software that allowed users to upload a photo of themselves and engage in a virtual try-on. But as Neil told us, they did a gut check and decided that the technology was good but not great. This ultimately led to the idea of a home try-on. The way this works is as a customer, you pick five frames, which are shipped free of charge, to try on at home. After five days, you ship them back, again free of charge, along with your decision about which frames you like best. Their other obstacle was the website. If you're just selling cheap eyeglasses online, you can slap together a site. But if you're Warby Parker and you want to create a fashion brand and also convince people to change behavior and trust that you can get the perfect frames from a website, you need to really sweat the user experience. And sweat it they did. Neil talked about how they spent months using PowerPoint to mock up wireframes of the site and testing it with friends. The common theme here is that these guys had a completely different mindset than a typical tech startup. It was obvious that they understood the importance of getting the customer experience just right. Neil likes to challenge the tech startup notion of minimally viable product, which is part of the tech startup canon. What this says is you need to be lean, get an acceptable product out there, and don't hold out for something perfect. While there's a lot about Warby Parker that is lean and scrappy, the minimal viable product shouldn't get in the way of your minimal viable vision. That's what makes the Warby Parker story so great. They're living in this hybrid world between the tech startup and the fashion lifestyle brand. And that's not easy to do. I think it is hard. I would say that we have viewed ourselves as living in three distinct worlds. One is this sort of fashion lifestyle world. The other is indeed the the tech startup world. Um, and then the social enterprise world. So in terms of tech and startup, yeah, how can we be scrappy? How can we move quickly? I mean, we started this business with only $120,000. Um, and, um, you know, very much believe in in technology and being data-driven. I think the fashion and lifestyle piece was just being a little more thoughtful than your typical tech startup in terms of what is the brand, what does it stand for, will it resonate with people. So for us, we spent a lot of time thinking about what are we and are we not? What do we stand for? What are our core values? You know, debating words like collegiate versus preppy, whereas one stands for self-improvement and learning, and the other stands for uh, a, a style of, of clothes and perhaps a socioeconomic s- status. That so i got to really... imagine the former one out there. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. More collegiate than preppy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you guys uh, uh, decided to not go into, like when you tried to build awareness for the company, it wasn't going to Wired necessarily. You were looking more towards the fashion world in terms of media. Is that right? Uh, Absolutely. The the question is, you know, what informs your fashion buying habits, right? It's not really sort of the tech media, it's it's the fashion media. So we were really deliberate in targeting sort of the best men's book and the best women's book, which is GQ and and Vogue. Uh, And if you think about the first three things we invested in, it was our first collection of glasses, it was our website, and it was PR. Um, and in February 2010, we launched We launched to features in Vogue and GQ, and the company took off like a rocket ship. We hit our first year sales targets in three weeks, sold out of our top 15 styles in four weeks, and accumulated a wait list of about 20,000 people, and it was just mayhem. Wow. So uh, a wait list of customers is not necessary. It's awesome, but also it's got to be nerve-wracking, right? Uh, it was terrifying. So how, how did, the, did those people stick around? Um, 
thankfully they did but we again we were full-time students when we launched the company and we lit would literally cut class just to answer the phones and respond to customer <laughs> emails we, we tried actually responding to customer emails while we were in class but we then got caught because the we were typing so loudly that the professor sort of stopped talking and then everybody in the class sort of looked at us and we were still typing and it was clear we weren't taking notes <laughs> <laughs> you didn't run a lot of ads in the beginning that wasn't how you guys did it so in a way uh, you were disruptive in how you what you wanted to do the market you also were unconventional in how you thought about your marketing yeah, we um, really wanted to build the business through word of mouth, through press, to introduce the brand through credible sources. Um, and that was uh, because we wanted to build uh, a long-lasting brand. And we'd also seen and, and heard from some of our professors at Wharton that that was actually cheaper to do and in the long run leads to higher customer lifetime value. So there's been a lot of studies that show that customers that come in through word of mouth actually will are more loyal, will purchase more over time than customers that come in through advertising. And it makes sense because yep. you trust your friends. So what we would always try and do is figure out, well, what what can we do that people want to talk about, that the press will want to write about? So, you know, the home try-on program was a classic example. It, it filled a need, but it ended up being this great marketing tool. It's G novel, right, people? It's an interesting story. Exactly. Yeah. So GQ called Warby Parker the, the Netflix of eyewear. Yeah. Um, and now as we continue to grow, you know, we built uh, a mobile store out of an old yellow school bus. We literally bought an old yellow school bus, ripped out the seats, uh, put in beautiful oak shelves, uh, and now it's in its 10th city over the last six months. We call it the Warby Parker Class Trip. It's got its own website, warbyparkerclasstrip.com, and it uh, just allows people to interact and, and feel the brand in a different way. And you know, when you buy a pair of glasses on the bus, it actually comes in a brown paper bag, just as sort of a lunch that <laughs> you're, you would on, have. you're on the school bus, yeah. And those little moments, those details that are unexpected lead to conversations. And over 50% of our traffic and sales is driven by word of mouth. So, it, but also it, it's a different way to think about marketing. Marketing, I, I think, has become almost a layer of abstraction between the company and the, you know, here's a slick surface that will give you a sense of what we're all about. And it sounds like you're doing the opposite. It's, it's much like trying to expose who you guys are as people, your culture, and hope that people want to be a part of that. Yeah, I, I think the internet has fundamentally changed branding and marketing. Um, you used to really be able to control your image uh, through uh, sort of literally like a glossy ad in a print magazine. Um, but now with the internet, there's so much access to information uh, and consumers are consuming it and demanding it. So it's not just good enough that your ad campaign looks good. And people need to understand the inspiration behind it, behind it, how it ties to the brand. Who are the people behind the brand and the employees that work there? What do they care about? Uh, where's the product made? How is it made? You know, there's a lot more depth that is required. And there's a uh, now sort of infinite space that you can share those stories and customers can, can learn about who you are. Coming up, we'll talk more with our guest, Neil Blumenthal, co-CEO of Warby Parker. Neil and I will explore Warby Parker's mission of building a profitable and scalable company that also does good in the world and how they believe that mission is the best way to compete in an industry dominated by an incumbent like Luxottica. You're listening to PJA Radio's The Unconventionals. If you'd like to learn more about the show, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash unconventionalsradio. Our academic sponsor for The Unconventionals is a Center on Global Brand Leadership at Columbia Business School, which turns the research of academia's foremost thinkers on branding into political tools and insight for real-world application. For more information, visit globalbrands.org. Welcome back to The Unconventionals. My guest today is Neil Blumenthal, founder and co-CEO of Warby Parker. 
Warby Parker launched in 2010 and is shaking up the eyewear industry by offering fashionable glasses at insanely low prices, starting at 95 bucks for frames and prescription lenses. As you heard earlier, GQ went so far as to call them the Netflix of eyewear. As owners of multiple brands, retailers, and even a vision insurance company, Luxottica claims to have over a half a billion people around the world wearing their glasses. Warby Parker is taking a punch, in fact, multiple punches at the giant, and I was curious as to whether Luxottica had noticed them, and more so if they've responded. Uh, well, I guess when you're selling uh, half a billion, <laughs> that's, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, you know, I think that's really tough for incumbents to compete with insurgents. Um, a, they're just not designed to. Um, and for them to compete with us on price and, and, and bring down their prices to $95, uh, they would cannibalize their own sales. And it takes a really brave leader to be willing to sort of do that and reinvent themselves. Um, and, but I think that these large companies need to start looking themselves in the mirror and, and taking a lot more risks because change is happening faster than ever before. It used to be that um, companies had to make drastic change maybe once every 50 years. You look at American Express. In 1958, um, they were working with a management consulting firm who told them not to get into the credit card business because it would cannibalize traveler's checks. Can you imagine if American Express (laughs) accepted that advice? Um, But now you have these big companies that need to be making those decisions not once every 50 years, not once every 10 years, but now once every couple of years. Um, So the question is, uh, will the big guys be able to sort of uh, have that appetite for risk that they need. Right. Well, I mean, one way is you develop an appetite for risk or you just buy the people who took risks. And, uh, and Luxottica has done that. They bought Ray-Ban and Oakley, and which I'm sure, you know, still cool brands, but at one point were cool independent companies. So, I mean, you guys must talk about this, but if Luxottica came to you with a really big check in hand, what keeps you guys from saying, awesome, right. let's do it? Yeah, you know, our our goal is to build this lifestyle brand that's going to have massive impact in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously I'm not in the position to have a big check in front of me. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the hope is that's not going to be the only consideration is, you know, can we affect the change that we set out to, um, you know, by being acquired? And, uh, you know, I'm not so sure. I, I don't know of um, really, you know, impactful brands or subsidiaries of other companies. A common theme on The Unconventionals is that starting a business is about changing the world in some important way. It's not just about selling the company and cashing in. In a world where the storyline seems to be the norm, it's refreshing to hear contrarian opinions from company leaders. Neil also mentions that any decisions about the future of his company will rely heavily on whether or not their social responsible missions can be maintained. So what are those missions? Warby Parker's focus isn't just on selling great glasses and keeping customers happy. That's critical, but table stakes. They're also driven to reinvent the optical market, uh, to be a force for good, uh, to create a culture that cares about its people. And that's an awful lot to be concerned about. And, and I asked Neil if it was tricky to balance all those things, especially for a startup. We think about this in terms of the mission and what do we want to accomplish and why do we wake up and get excited to come to work every morning. Um, And if you ask anybody here in the office, it's really two things. One is we want to radically transform the optical industry and transfer billions of dollars from the Luxoticas of the world to normal people. Uh, And the second is to build an example of a business that um, is scalable, profitable, but does good in the world and doesn't charge a premium for it. We think that that's a powerful idea, and we need more examples of this so that way more entrepreneurs create businesses in this model and that more Fortune 500 executives sort of steer their companies in this direction because ultimately businesses can be and should be a catalyst for good. Well, I I completely agree, and I think it's funny, but that's not necessarily what we've grown up on, right? There's a sense that there's business and then there's your passions, and those are two different things. There's uh, making money, and then there's doing good in the world, and those are two different things. And I, it doesn't sound like you see them as two different things. Yeah, definitely not. And it just it 
it's crazy that we've created that separation, especially since the majority of your day is, is spent at work, right? You should be doing something that you love and that you enjoy. Uh, and also now with mobile devices, uh, there's no separation between work and, and personal life anymore. Um, so uh, if, there, if that merger is, is taking place already, then you might as well do it in a way that, that you enjoy. And most people want to have a positive impact. And frankly, uh, the world currently demands it, right? The, the problems that we face uh, as humanity is more complex and larger than ever before. And volunteering on the weekends is not going to solve it. You know, it, it, it occurs to me when I talk to you, it doesn't really sound like you're a business person. And I, and I, I don't mean that in a bad way. <laughs> like the way you talk about your company doesn't sound like you're talking about a business so much. Yeah, I, I guess that could be a compliment. I'm, I, I definitely come from the nonprofit world. Yeah. Um, uh, although the MBA part of me probably is uh, whining right now. But yeah, no, you know, we're trying to to some extent, I actually think of myself actually as a, a coach. And I think of Warby Parker, not so much as a business or even a family, even though we have aspects that are very familial. It's almost uh, more as a sports team where people have joined Warby Parker uh, because they want to achieve something great. They want to win the championship um, and they're going to bust their butts and they're going to hold each other accountable to do that. Um, whereas in a family, you're sort of born into it, right? And, and yeah. you, you didn't choose to join and you tolerate the drunk uncle. Yeah. <laughs> no drunk uncles in uh, Warby Parker. Exactly. They don't last, I imagine. Yeah. Towards the end of this year's NBA regular season, uh, Indiana Pacers center Roy Hibbert was part of a small social media meme that stemmed from a post-game press conference. If you don't remember it, here's part of the presser from NBA.com. How are you guys doing tonight? You guys all right? Yeah, doing all right. Um, I usually... <laughs> I'm sorry. I uh, asked my teammate Paul if I should do this, but this is my first time at the podium basically all year. And, um, and you know, a lot of people always wear, like, crazy get-ups and stuff like that. <laughs> so I said to myself before the game, I'm going to have a great game tonight. And I, uh, from, I was advised by Paul George and David Benner not to, to set a trend by wearing a monocle. So I'm, put, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not putting on the monocle, but uh, I go ahead and ask questions. <laughs> The monocle Roy is holding just happens to be a Warby Parker monocle appropriately named the Colonel. The interesting part to this story is that when he eventually donned the eyepiece, most people thought he looked ridiculous, and that's what started the social media frenzy. Now, NBA postgame fashion has become a hot topic debate in recent years. Miami Heat guard Dwayne Wade seemingly always at the forefront. But it brings up an interesting question. There's nothing more fleeting than social media memes and fashion trends. So I asked Neil if it was difficult to build a lasting company in this world. Yeah, you know, I, I think w our point of view is sort of classic American heritage, beautiful design uh, that is timeless. And actually, one of our design principles, and I sort of uh, have it written down for everybody to see, is we will not design anything that we will be embarrassed wearing in 20 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I, I think that we can build a brand uh, around that and still take risks from a fashion standpoint, but as long as they're rooted in sort of classic, beautiful design, I, I think we'll be in, in good shape. Next time on The Unconventionals, what does it mean if all of us have the potential to be makers and product manufacturers? We'll be talking to Bree Pettis, founder of MakerBot, the pioneer in 3D printing. The Unconventionals is written and produced by Michael Toole with Reed Mangan. Post-production and technical direction by Reed Mangan with Emmanuel Ording. Promotion and distribution by Greg Straface. Our creative director is Aaron De Silva. Our executive producer is Phil Johnson for PJA Advertising and Marketing. I'm Jafia Leahy. To hear more episodes of The Unconventionals, visit pjaradio.com. 